Welcome to the uh, Open University. I'm standing in some quite bright morning sunshine. It's a very windy day, so there's going to be some scintillating effects on my body, some interesting effects. I'm wearing my vintage Benetton sweater uh, as a tribute to one of the founders of Benetton, Roberto Benetton, I think he was called, who just died this week at the age of 67, I think he was. And um, Benetton, a brand who became a byword for... Um, a certain kind of provocation in the 90s and uh, also for a certain sort of global multiculturalism, the united colours of Benetton. And um, so at the same time, it would be a sort of double whammy. there would be this punch of assumed liberalism, since they were uniting different races in their adverts. A lot of, for instance, a, a, a white woman cradling a black baby. That was the epitome of 90s uh, globalisation and multiculturalism. Uh, but also they um, were provoking because they'd show, for instance, a bloody fetus. Uh, they seem to deal a lot with baby imagery. A bloody fetus. This was all the, um, the work of um, <laughs> their chief creative, whose name I've forgotten now, the photographer. Um, there's a caption at this very moment saying who, who he is. Uh, oh, oh, Toscani, of course. Olivieri Toscani. Um, there's even, to show how 90s this whole thing is, there's even a reference in a David Bowie song um, <laughs> to my David Bowie impersonation, to Benetton. Getting, getting my facts from a Benetton ad uh, is, is one of the lines, the first line, one of the very first lines you encounter in Black Tie, White Noise, which is one of Bowie's worst albums, 1991 album, horrible programming, sort of mediocre cover versions of Scott Walker. Numbers and sort of self-congratulatory <laughs> songs about his wedding, this kind of thing. So, but he was uh, obviously mocking the idea of getting facts from a Benetton ad, um, because it, because it's a kind of <laughs> sledgehammer to crack a nut. I mean, you want subtlety when you're gathering facts. It's very difficult, especially in our times now, to be subtle. Maybe I'll. I had no idea when I started talking what I was going to talk about today. Um, but maybe I'll talk about subtlety and about small-scale things. I've always had this idea that um, you, um, you should avoid intensity. I think I've spoken before in these lectures about avoiding intensity. And drugs, I mean, the whole concept of this book I'm writing, this memoir I'm writing just now, Drugs, is the kind of one-liner that I have never done drugs, and here's a drugs memoir about my struggle with drugs, a struggle which I never had. I never actually had to wrestle with my own self-indulgence. I never had to put other people's money up my nose as a, one of those archetypal typal rock stars. I was just reading about the awful Freddie Mercury biopic, which has just come out. Um, the one that they were going to, um, <clears throat> they were going to have um, Sasha Cohen Barron, as Freddie, which might have been interesting, but they've, they've cast someone else, and it's, um, it's produced, co-produced by the surviving members of Queen, and so they wanted to really show that Queen was not just Freddie, and that they had a successful career after Freddie disappeared, and all sorts of agendas which they had, which kind of have, have undermined this film, which shows that you need a certain dispassion if you're dealing with a rock biography. Um, do I have that kind of dispassion in my, in my book? I'm not sure, but I am avoiding intensity. And um, I think it's, uh, it's a principle I picked up from nuclear physics. Weirdly enough, the strong force is what gets unleashed when you rip apart atoms and you create an atomic explosion. Um, the kind of thing that the current administration in the US is trying to... Uh, they want to um, lower the barriers to nuclear war. This is one of the reasons John Bolton has ripped up the uh, nuclear treaty with Russia so that they can pop off little missiles to little conflicts here and there. I think that's a, a long-term goal. Although I have to say I'm impressed by the fact that this administration, awful and idiots though they are, have not really started any major wars yet. Um, not for lack of trying probably, but they, they haven't been hawkish. They've been isolationist. So anyway, um, we're not yet, we're not in World War III. Um, I, I actually, the, probably the, the shadow of that kind of 
conflict is less now than at any time in my life. I was listening yesterday to a Tom Lehrer album called That Was The Year That Was, in which he's got a, he's got a song about World War Three, which will be over in 90 minutes. You know, it's like taking all the cliches from the World War Two songs. You know, Ma, I have to go off and do this fight, but at least it's in a just cause, and I'll be back in about five years. But in World War Three, I'll be back in about 90... Well, it'll be over in 90 minutes. I won't be back. Um, because we, we lived under the shadow of um, annihilation. Uh, another thing I was watching recently was the Poetry USA series um, from the 60s about Robert Lowell. And Robert Lowell was describing his poem. I think it's called... Uh, it's just called 1962, something like September 1962. But it's a um, famous, very famous poem, One Swallow Makes a Summer. Um, it's kind of echoing Yeats a little bit, Byzantium. Um, but uh, he's talking about the nuclear, the, the Cuba missiles crisis. And um, there's a line in there which I stole for my song, What Will Death Be Like? It's this line, um, we're like uh, a lot of spiders clinging together and crying. Um, and Lowell, in this documentary, actually says he got this from his five-year-old daughter. He, uh, she, he's, um, he's sitting with her. What is it? They're reading... I think they're watching television, or, or no, they're listening to the radio, and on comes um, some music by Webern, Anton Webern, who's a very good composer I like very much. And um, Robert says to his daughter, you're not going to like this, this is very serious music. And, and so she says, well, let's listen. And, and they listen to the beginning, and, he sa and Robert says, what does it sound like to you? And she says, it sounds like... First of all, she says it sounds like a lot of wolves howling, and then she says it sounds like uh, something else. And then for, uh, the third thing is that it sounds like spiders crying, clinging together in a room and crying. So Lowell takes this line, puts it in as a symbol of the world gone crazy, and the world gone upside down. Or, you know, this, uh, the idea of spiders making any kind of sound is quite sinister in and of itself. So... Um, I put that into it. It's one of the many, many references in uh, What Would Death Be Like. Uh, the book I'm writing just now is also really just composed of nothing but references and nothing but pastiches of other voices and things. This is the, the problem that presented itself to me making a memoir, making an autobiography, was this idea of the continuous voice, the tone <coughs> that you, you strike at the beginning of these books and then that you, you keep to all the way through as you describe your life. It implies a kind of continuity of ego, which I don't really believe in. I, I kind of think, although probably I would strike you as being very similar now to what I was like at 12, you know, the, there are core similarities. I'm quite apprehensive, I'm articulate, you know, I'm kind of uh, literary and aesthetic and also quite visually oriented. Um, Despite that, I feel that I'm more like my hero David Bowie in the sense that he could sort of become different people at different points. Anyone who impressed him was, was the next thing he was going to try to emulate, try to become. So you see him in about 1970. I, I think the 1979 David Bowie is my absolute favorite because he gets quite posh. He, 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 sort of, he sort of says, good Lord, you know. Would you mind passing me my, one of my cigarettes? He's sort of trying to be actorish because he's doing a lot of acting. He's just come out of role, of course, and carried the persona with him of this uh, aristocrat, Prussian aristocrat. He's playing in just a gigolo. Uh, so in '78, we got the tour brochures from Isolar Two Tour, I think it was called, uh, in which most of the photographs of him in this big um, A3 size um, souvenir are of him dressed up as a Prussian aristocrat from about 1920. You know, and, um, you know, so he's got a bow tie and sort of very, very smart suits and things, and he's, he's pulling a very serious face, and he's got a little pair of leather gloves dangling at his waist. And um, so there's that side of him, which is he's socially sounding quite aristocratic, you know, and there's also the side of him which is that he's thinking at that point of moving to Japan, so he's very Asian and quite, his Buddhist side is to the fore. And also, there's the side where he's doing avant-pop and he's experimenting with Brian Eno, and um, so all those things brought together an experimental avant-garde aristocrat who's influenced by Japan and is thinking of going to live in Japan. I mean, how could that not appeal to me? Um, I, was, I was kind of starved to books about Japan, 
I, I, another thing I've been doing recently is, because I've been in the, the late 60s in terms of where I'm writing my memoir, and I, I was watching old Top of the Popses. I didn't realise there even were any Top of the Popses which had survived from the late 60s. There are only about two. One of them has links which are mute, you know, you just hear the songs, but the, the links by the Scottish, I think it was called Stuart Henry, a uh, Scottish DJ, um, are, are inaudible for the most part. Um, Another is late 67, because actually this was quite a major breakthrough to me. I was always a bit sniffy, a bit aristocratic about pop music when I was a kid. I hated the Beatles, She Loves You, Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. You know, I, I thought that was, I didn't like people saying yeah instead of yes or hi instead of hello. I didn't like any kind of Americanism when I was a child. I was very snobby about that. Americanism represented populism and, and you know, <laughs> we can see today where that leads. But, um, so... The Beatles were not, and, and we had friends like the Locketts, uh, we had this family who lived in Air, who were very influential actually on my parents. Uh, um, Mr. Lockett was a lawyer and his wife um, was a was Danish, and she influenced my mother a lot in terms of the her, her Scandinavian mid-century modern kind of tastes, so we, we had a, a, a component in our house of this kind of good design, the Scandinavian design, a lot of which came from a shop called um, the um, Royal Mile Boutique, which was run by a Swiss exile called Hartmann, Otto Hartmann. And he sold fantastic cutlery and sort of plates, very, everything very modern in that sort of Scandinavian mid-century way they had in the 20th century. So um, that could be complemented by furniture from Norway House, which was up on Shandwick Place, where um, Habitat later moved in. Habitat now has disappeared again. This is something I've been thinking about also recently, is whether fashion and design and all the rest of it is dead. For instance, the fact that, you know, when I went to university, straight leg jeans came in and had skinny collars and skinny ties. This was the new wave look. 1978 was when I went up to university. Um, and it was such a sea change, it was such an immediate thing that the hippie era, because punk came along and punk was very hostile, especially John Lydon, very hostile to old hippies and punk, people with long hair and flares, it was finished. They were dinosaurs overnight, they were boring old farts. Um, so there was no way, if you were in any way attuned to style, that you could take your flares and just wear them at university. I mean, I moved from Edinburgh to Aberdeen in 78. My mother, before I left, bought me a a gull wing leather jacket. Is that what they're called? Wing collared leather jacket with huge, you know, the, the collar would come out to the tips of your shoulders, basically. So the sort of thing that Marky e. Smith perversely would keep wearing uh, and make almost a kind of one man fashion out of, you know, these big collars and sort of flared slacks and things. But everybody else who was into New Wave, you know, if you were into stiff records or whatever, you couldn't possibly. So the, the first thing I remember doing when I got to Aberdeen as a student, October 78, was um, taking this leather jacket into an alterations place and some little old tailor cut off the leather collar and made it a really skinny collar. And um, I had straight leg jeans. Before that, I'd been buying Wranglers and things. Later, of course, I went off jeans entirely and I hadn't worn a pair of jeans for decades now. I, th I consider... See, I'm a very moral person, but in probably slightly awkward and strange ways, I'm very moral about the the problems of the world being the things that everybody does. Conformism is the greatest thing. Monoculture is the greatest problem that confronts us. When we're all driving cars and think it's normal, that's when we screw up the world with, with exhaust fumes and carbon emissions and things, and the geopolitics of oil. Um, when we all have children, that's when we should stop having children. So the most sinful things for me are driving a car, having a family, and um, wearing denim. You know, Wearing denim is the purely symbolic aesthetic side of it, but uh, I think it's inexcusable. And, and, and these sort of Nike and Adidas type sports gear, sportswear, that's what I totally avoid, or, or any kind of clothes with writing on it. Um, um, you know, the sort of dreadful conformity of uh, the Nike uh, swoosh being a kind of tick people wear as a, I've been approved in a Darwinian kind of way, I'm actually fit for life, and those others are not, you know, I'm ready to run, I'm fit, even if you're not, if your body's actually not uh, in shape at all, you can still claim to be fit, and um, 
So yeah, uh, what was I talking about? God, this has been a long <laughs> a ramble. I was talking about the strong force and the weak force. The strong force in nuclear physics, I suppose this could be related to conformity as well. Um, conformity being the strong force. And something that Susan Sontag said has always stayed with me, and that is that um, she described rock music as aggressive normality. And at a certain point, rock ceased to be the, the, the devil's music and the rebel's music and became mainstream uh, you know, assertiveness, but assertiveness in the service of normality. And I think Susan Sontag was the only person I'd ever seen commenting on this, possibly seeing it in a gendered way, but probably not. I don't think it was even about toxic masculinity in rock. It was more about, and you know, the guitar being the ultimate phallic symbol and all the rest of it. It was more about... Um, um, aggressiveness. And so when I titled my 1988 album Tender Pervert, I sort of wanted to invert that, just make a, a flip from aggressive normality to tender perversion. And it seemed to me that you could trust, because I was reading Georges Bataille and stuff like that in the 80s and Mishima and, and perversity, sexual perversity even, especially in the light of Section 28, the Conservative government at the time trying to um, make a gay, the promotion of a gay lifestyle against the law, you know, to, in schools or in libraries, you were not allowed to promote homosexuality as a legitimate alternative lifestyle because of AIDS, making it a medical crisis, but also because uh, they simply had this conservative agenda against it. Um, so um, I thought a, a philosophy of gentle deviance was... Um, the closest I could find to virtue, which was ironic since it was also considered generally vice at that time. So I became, in a sense, part of a queer, a queer movement, um, the queering of even straight people's art. Um, I, I thought I should make an album in solidarity with uh, gay people and with... Um, um, it wasn't identity politics, though. For me, it was more like a, a bataille, acéphale movement. And the acéphale movement was a mid... 20th century French, well, from the 30s onwards, French movement related to surrealism, related to the Marquis de Sade. Um, so very much not a kind of wishy-washy, um, you know, accept me and my special identity kind of um, thing. It was more, uh, it, was, it was about being crazy and being unacceptable and, and, and transgressing. This was the most important verb for those people, transgression, the idea of... Um, precisely what is socially unacceptable. I think literature always has to have elements of that in it for, for it to be interesting to me personally. You have to be saying something, because it's already such, a, such an intimate and subversive gesture to be writing a book and, and telling your innermost secrets. I think books, the best books always have this sense of saying something that's embarrassing and secretive, and yet you know that you share this furtive bond with the, the hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable, mon frère, as, um, oh, who said that? <laughs> who said that? Was it uh, Baudelaire? Um, hypocrite reader, my, my like, my, my, my double, in a sense, and my brother. Uh, brother, of course, gendered, uh, it could be your sister too. Um, hypocrite lecteur, ma soeur. Um, so, uh, <laughs> how much time have I covered with that? Yeah, it's kind of, um, kind of just a, just a, these things, when you're thinking about your life, you're sort of making sense of your... You may not be making sense of the continuousness of persona or, or of personality, because in a sense that make, in a way that makes sense of itself. That is um, a given, and you can't really control it. Some of it obviously comes from your parents. I'm probably not that dissimilar, not as dissimilar as I'd like to think, to my father, uh, who, who was... He was quite a detached person, but he was also fair-minded and generous and quite gentle. He had a, he had a sort of butcher side to him where he would butcher animals because he was shooting birds and animals and fishing fish and things like that. But at the same time, in his treatment of us as children, he was always very kind and very generous, and, and he would really encourage you to express yourself. So I'm realising that he was my first recording engineer, for instance. He was the one bringing the tape recorder and asking me to sing. He published a short story of mine when I was four years old. Can you believe that? Which is reproduced in the book in full. It's a very short little section. He just he set up a tape recorder, recorded me um, 
improvising, as I'm doing just now, but a little story about a bell bouncing down a road which kills a dog and, you know, the crazy, it's a real kind of story, so um, already being influenced by the French, I guess. Um, so yeah, he recorded my first short story when I was four, my first songs when I was seven. So yeah, I was talking about the top of the pops is, um, I can date exactly the point at which I uh, start to get interested in pop music as late 1967. It's probably November or December 1967 when my father brought home that same Uher tape recorder. I think it was called a Report 4000. It was designed for reporters in the field. It was meant to be compact. It was actually about that size and had a strap, and, but it could run on batteries like the Nagra recorders. And um, we record, apart from recording the singing songs and things, there's a whole EP's worth of songs which she recorded me. There was not just I Can See Japan, which is actually on a sort of secret track on um, the Little Red Songbook, but also uh, a song called The Miser. The miser walks in foreign lands, he holds the money in his hands. Uh, a song about getting married, da 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 the day that we got married. And um, then there's a song about uh, we can fly, we can fly up so high, we can fly. It, that was pretty much the whole song, just, and nobody can catch us, we can fly, we can fly. Dun, 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 dun. So I can remember these songs, although I think the recordings may not exist anymore. I think the tapes have been lost of them, but they're, they're all taped in there. But anyway, all this interest in pop music, the decision that pop was not in for dig, really starts with this recording that he made with that same tape recorder of Top of the Pops in pretty much 67 November, because that's when The Who appeared doing I Can See For Miles, which was the template for I Can See Japan, um, obviously, similarities. I can see further than you guys. I can see for Miles is an interesting song because it's actually about marital infidelity or his girlfriend cheating on him. Uh, but he can see, Pete Townsend wrote the song of course, he can see because he's got magic in his eyes and of course it's got this vaguely psychedelic feeling to it. You get the sense that the magic is chemical. It's uh, actually uh, pharmaceutical magic. And so it could be paranoia, it could just be all in his head. You know, he's got magic in his eyes and he's got jealousy in his head and he can see. So if she betrays, it's a kind of threatening song, a rather nasty, menacing song in which he says, you know, you better stay in line because uh, I can see anything you're getting up to. Wow, it's really windy now. There's probably some great scintillating lighting effects on me. Um, but the... That whole side of infidelity was lost on me. I was a kid of seven, you know, how could I know about staying true and being faithful and all that stuff. So I thought it was a song about just having amazing visual acuity, which at the time I did have. I didn't have to wear glasses. I had very good eyesight. I had two eyes, you know, at that time. I still have two eyes, but one of them screwed up and screws my life up because it keeps giving me nasty headaches about once a month. Um, but, uh, yeah, I thought, wow, it's about vision, I guess kind of physical vision, but also um, wanting to and being able to perceive somehow with a sixth sense what other people's lives are like on the other side of the world. And um, that was super important to me, the idea that a global vision, you know, the idea that it was, there were other ways of living, there wasn't just one, they were equally valid to ours, in fact maybe better, and also that love could connect you to people on the other side of the world. So the, the whole lyric of that song is, I can see Japan, I can see the mountaintops, I can see the villages, I can see your images, and maybe best of all, I can see your love. So um, it was, um, actually I was even listening to the Top of the Pops from 67, thinking, are there any songs where people just talk the lines instead of sing them? Where did I get that idea from? You know, if I'm just composed of all the the things that impressed me. And there was actually a song, I forget what it was, was now, there was a song on that, uh, uh, I think December 67, YouTube uh, video of Top of the Pops with Jimmy Savile, unfortunately, presenting it. Um, I think it might be Manfred Mann. There's a Manfred Mann track, and uh, is it Quinn the Eskimo? Or, or, or no, maybe it's another band. I, I, all the bands, I really don't know the bands in the 60s that well. I'm sort of... But there was one where they... they uh, um, talk a line, or, or a couple of lines, you know, and that was uh, added, that was an arrow that I could put into my quiver, you know, it's a sort of a dramatic effect if you just talk the last line, you know, it sounds more sincere, don't sing it, talk it, you know. 
So these are the kind of issues I'm pondering. I'm not going out very much. Um, I've got a little holiday coming up quite soon to see my girlfriend. And, um, but, uh, yeah, it's a very quiet time for me, pleasantly quiet, very solitary as well. I'm sort of not, um, not really socialising so much. Uh, loving just being in my flat and uh, watching the weather as it passes, watching the seasons as they change, but m mainly um, rummaging about in my past. I'm really upset, actually, because I've lost a few important things. I seem to have lost a five-year diary, which I kept um, between, or, or members of the family kept, not just me, my brother. Although my brother, when he kept it, he started every day with the same line, in morning, had breakfast. He just was filling it up, you know, for the sake of filling it up with mechanically repetitive tropes, you know, whereas I tried to... I'm certainly the opposite. I try to make every day start differently, you know, have a perky rhythm. Wow, something amazing happened. You know, it's almost like um, people try to, to um, these BuzzFeed type lines, we try to make people read it so that they click through as many ads as possible. Though, of course, there were no ads in the five year diary. But it was mostly the period where we as family lived in Canada, Montreal. And um, it would have been useful, but then again, you know, um, Writing this memoir, I realized that what's important, you know, print the legend, print what you remember as being important. Don't get bogged down in details. Details are not interesting to readers. And I think what one tends to remember at the age I'm at now is the, um, the transformative things, the, 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 the swiveling moments, you know, the moments where you actually went off in a new direction. And... Um, it almost doesn't matter if they really happened or not. What matters is that you think they happened and that in, in retrospect you piece your life together and say that was a really pivotal moment. Um, so that, that is really what I'm writing about. And it doesn't really matter if I skip breakfast, you know, skip describing what we had for breakfast. What, what matters is that you recognise those moments which were pivotal and then you describe them in a certain way. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Open University. <laughs>